I'm Renee Richard. Today I'm in Point Capit Parish, and actually I'm standing in St. Mary of Fausto River Catholic Church. Uh, this is the second church that's been built pretty much um, on the same piece of property. This church was built in 1907. Um, over my shoulder you see the baptismal font, and they've been baptizing here for many years, even prior to that in this region. We're sitting on the banks of Fausto River, and there's a beautiful cross out front that when I was researching this, told the story of, of the original one that was here 100, 150 years ago when the original church was built in 1823, and it served to beckon people that traveled literally for 20 miles away to come to Mass here because Foss River is an oxbow river, an offshoot of the Mississippi, and this parish then covered that whole region. So that cross outside and this church facade facing the river has been an icon in this community. So join us as we explore St. Mary of Foss River Catholic Church and Parish. my guest today, Father Pat Broussard, pastor here at St. Mary's. And Father, thank you so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank now, you. from what I understand, you're relatively new Absolutely. to this parish, correct? Uh, assigned here is September 4th of 2018, and um, it's, it's been wonderful. It's truly been wonderful. Very good. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your faith journey. Well, I'm, I'm a late vocation, as you know. I'm a transplant from uh, New Iberia, Louisiana. Ah. Moved uh, to Baton Rouge in uh, 2001. I entered, in, entered into diaconate formation in 2003 here in Baton Rouge. Was ordained a deacon in 2010. Uh, served uh, for seven years in uh, Port Allen as a deacon. Um, during that time, my wife passed, and I uh, discerned priesthood. Mm -hmm. Went to seminary in uh, two, fall of 2015, was ordained uh, a couple of years later, spent a year or 15 months at St. Thomas More in Baton Rouge, and then was assigned here in September. Very good. So when you were assigned here, did you know very much about this parish or about this region? Actually, a little. I, I, was, uh, I was in the oil field, and this area, the Tuscaloosa, was a big part of oh, my yes. territory. <laughs> So I got to know the area much better than I got to know the people, uh, sadly, but uh, it didn't take long at all to get to know the people here. They're very wonderful, very open, uh, very friendly and embracing. That's it, and you are so lucky because the one thing about this parish and really all of Point Capi and the, and the religious community here is that it has always had fabulous historians going all the way back to the first pastor, really, that came to St. Mary's. And we'll talk a little bit more about the history of St. Mary's, but Father Gouton was here for like 35 years before he died, from like 1865 to like the 1890s when he died. And he wrote, in even in our sacramental registers, I think he kept journals. Um, but besides that, you have great, you have, over the years have had um, Glenn Morgan, who was an architect, but was also very well known for collecting the history of this area, and now Brian Costello, mm -hmm. who has written over 30 books. And Brian, of course, has been our guest. If you've followed our show, you have seen Brian at least three times on, on previous shows um, about the Catholic Church in Point Capi. But we have never done a show specifically about St. Mary and this okay. parish. Um, to start with, really, you have to go back to the origins of the Catholic faith in the whole region. And this is the cradle of Catholicism for our diocese. Um, we had a church here beginning in 1728. is the first recorded um, mm -hmm. entry. However, they do know that there was religious activity and missionaries coming through as early as the early, early 1720s. Mm -hmm. This being one of three places in the state of Louisiana, New Orleans, here, Natchitoches, that had churches. And really, what's in the region of our diocese St. Francis, or the Catholic Church in Point Capi, mm -hmm. led the others by at least 50 years. St. James and St. Gabriel were the next two to follow, again, along the river. So when we talk quickly, just briefly, about St. Francis, since we've done so much about it, the, the area that what we call New Roads now, actually, historically, was located along the Mississippi River, where the St. Francis Mission, because it's now a mission mm -hmm. of, of this church, is located. And it wasn't until much later that this area developed. So another important thing here is that it was Antoine Blanc, and he's come up many times in our shows, but Antoine Blanc was sent to be the pastor at St. Francis on, on the river, and that was like 
the 18, 19, 18, 18, in that time frame. Um, he later goes on to be the Bishop of New Orleans and the first archbishop when New Orleans was made into an archbishop. I'm not sure I'm saying that word. Archdiocese. Right. An archdiocese, thank you. Um, into the archdiocese. He was the first archbishop. Um, so very famous person that came here. Um, that started the ball rolling for this parish. He saw a need, and actually the town, what we call New Roads, was the result of a road that had been cut. They mm -hmm. called it the Chemin, 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 I can't say it in French, but <laughs> it means the New Road, and it was cut through by the Spanish government mm -hmm. like in the 1700s. False River, which is right outside our doors, and I think the actual correct name for this parish is St. Mary of False River. So False River is an oxbow, which means it was cut off from the Mississippi River, and people would have to go all the way around the whole perimeter in order to get to the church that was on the river. The Spanish government cut a road through, and then development started really taking off in this area. So it takes on the name New Roads, and it never left. I think at one time they called it the Village of St. Mary way back when, once this was established. I didn't know that either. And then they called it False River at the first post office. I learned a lot researching for this. But again, we never really, you know, talked about this parish. So Anton Blom, when he comes, sees the need for the development here and starts negotiations to build a church here. We were talking about Antoine Blanc coming here, and so he's here in the teens. He establishes the need for this parish, mm -hmm. and he's, he, his brother was also a priest, but together um, this parish began with them in 1823. So when it did start, um, it was a small white building, small white church that was built on False River. There actually at some point along the line was a cross that was put out front along the banks of False River, and it speculated that that cross was there so that people who came by boat would know where the church was located. Hmm. And amazingly, because plenty of our churches don't last that long, that little white church lasted for like 80 some odd years. This church was built in 1907. Hmm. Um, and so, and actually what they did is when they built this one, the white one stayed right next door. And I found one photo, hopefully we can get it for, for our viewers to see of both churches standing side by side. So they were able to continue mass um, in the original 1923 church mm -hmm. um, until this one was dedicated in, um, in 1907. So over the years, I think there've been um, changes and of course renovations to it. Most recently, you were telling me before we started, there were some things done just in the past few years to, right. to the help past this couple church. Of years, the, uh, the roof was, was changed, the new gutter system was put in. And, um, and since my arrival, we've, we've uh, upgraded the sound. Uh, it's, it's gotten oh, so that much better. better. There, was, there was some problems up there with the organ area, a blower that needed to be uh, corrected. And the sound system itself has been upgraded. And we added uh, hearing impaired um, um, like little mobile phones. units, yeah, yes, units. Where, where people can hear now that we had trouble before. As a matter of fact, I had one gentleman tell me uh, mm -hmm. after the first weekend, he said, uh, this is the first sermon I've heard here in more than 20 years. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's been wonderful in that. They've also uh, reconditioned uh, all of the, uh, the way the cross, which is, which beautiful. is beautiful. They were those are original, right? They are, yeah. they are, and reconditioned the beauty. They did a good, really good job. When you were talking just a while ago about the gentleman that hadn't heard the sermon, mm -hmm. what? Tell me a little bit about the demographics here. Is it an older congregation, or is, or is it young? I don't know about the community. What have you learned since you've been here in terms of, you know, like what size is it? How many families are here? We're 1,250 families, and uh, it, it's diverse in age. We've got uh, we've got a, a number of uh, our more seasoned parishioners that are here. Very glad to have them. I've got one couple that religiously comes every weekend. They're both near 95 years oh, old. Wow. That they come together. That's great. And um, what I'm very happy to see is that we've got a lot of uh, young families as well. We've got all across the board the middle age um, and, and coming down into the younger families. But um, what I'm seeing is more and more people coming and bringing their children, oh, which is wonderful. Yes. Love having the children in here. 
That's great. Um, being this is in a resort area, mm -hmm. do y'all get a lot from the, I know there are a lot of camps, but there's also a lot of people that live here. I'm just mm -hmm. asking, mainly for myself, do you, do you see a lot that are, that sure. come to Mass? Sure. Y'all are packing the masses. Um, <laughs> well, uh, not having gotten into the, uh, into summer, the summer months yet, yet but uh, I've met several people that have um, either second homes or camps here from New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and across, uh, back towards Lafayette. Uh, and always welcome, love to have them. We do get a lot of visitors, and uh, something I learned from one of my former pastors, Father David, that, that, that I know you've spoken with, is I try to open each Mass with a welcome to parishioners, visitors, Catholic and non-Catholic alike. And um, it, it seems to be drawing more people, and I'm very happy about that. Oh, very that's happy. awesome. It is a beautiful church. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, too, that um, when I was researching it, because these these beautiful stained glass windows that are mm -hmm. in here. Um, some were made in St. Louis, I believe. Some of them were actually made in Munich. Um, and you were telling me earlier about one in particular that you were saying was very rare. Tell right. us a little bit about that window. Right. Um, I, I don't know a whole lot about it other than uh, a, a friend of mine, a, a priest friend of mine was visiting and when he saw it, he said that there's only one other place in the world that this exact uh, stained glass window exists, and I've not been able to research that. But it's uh, it's a picture of picture of Christ looking at Peter after the scourging and um, the, and the, the denial where uh, Peter denies Jesus. It's a very soulful uh, look into Peter's eyes, and I've invited our parishioners this past uh, Good Friday as they come up to venerate the cross to just take a look over there and to see Jesus' suffering in that, I love you. He's saying, I love you. I understand, and, and, I'm, and I'm hurting with and for you. It's, it's a very deep look. If you look into his eyes, it's, it's, it speaks to us all differently, but I invite you to please take a look. Oh, when you and I were talking about it before we started, mm -hmm. I saw it, and it's very, very beautiful. Um, and the different, the, the windows depict different things in here, mainly the Stations of the Cross on either side. Um, but also at one of the points where the church itself was being um, maybe renovated or just updated, um, a local architect, local church historian, Glenn Morgan, and also um, um, Mr. Abair, and uh, Major Abair, who was also a local architect, designed windows for the facade of the church that depict the Catholic history of this region of Point Capi. And so there's various ones there actually showing um, the first St. Mary's Church in the picture and the old St. Francis and even the missionaries ministering to the Native Americans because we know in your history that the Tunica Indians were here and also right across the river at St. Francisville. Keep in mind with three churches in the 1700s, um, the, the priests here went all the way to Baton Rouge and beyond until, you know, St. Joseph came in 1790s. So, I mean, we're looking at 70 years, 50 years or more, um, ministering to the whole region. And so we know that those, they're in y'all's record books, actually going back to the baptism of the Native Americans um, here as well. So that's one thing that brings the old, this, mm -hmm. this 1907, which really we think of it as not being old, but it is, um, to the more modern with having something done by people who, a recent parishioners, fairly recent parishioners, designed something as beautiful as those front windows. And I thought that was very striking because mm -hmm. we don't see that when we visit some of these other churches. You know, you'll have an older church, but it's got the old windows or the previous windows in it. When I was researching this parish, mm -hmm. the original land was quite a bit, like over 100 acres which I'm sure is still not, 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 <laughs> not here. Quite. Um, not quite. But on the physical plant, what do you have here in terms of you know, other buildings, other facilities that y'all use? I noticed the, the park across the street, the Kiwanis Park, right, right, with the cross, right. that a, a replication of the big mm -hmm. cross. But what are some of the other? Um, well, we have the Adoration yes. Chapel, okay. um, as well as the new administrative building that was, uh, I think, finished around 2009, possibly, maybe okay. a little earlier. And will soon be paid for. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> of course, the rectory, which was built around the same time as this church building. So it's on the grounds. It's right next door. Oh, yes, okay, the big uh, it's building, big two-story house, uh, house yes. on the side. Um, St. Joseph's Center, which is between here and the rectory, which was an office at one time, but is now used for classrooms, uh, RCIA, uh, PSR, uh, baptism prep, things like that. And then the parish hall, which is in the back uh, of the property. 
that was recently, uh, we recently re replaced the roof and painted the outside and currently have a committee working on reconditioning the inside and most especially the kitchen. Okay. Um, we have a guest house in the back that um, needs a little work, but will soon be back in operation. And uh, that's all that's on this physical plant. Okay, now this church does have a cemetery. Yes. Um, is the cemetery on the same property? Is no, the cemetery is just a few blocks away. Okay, yes. okay, so that probably was part of that whole, Very possible. you know, 100 acres yes. when the other church was, was built. Mm -hmm. The cemetery here um, is an active cemetery because so oftentimes, um, you know, I know in Baton Rouge, St. Joseph's not active, but this is a rural community and this is an active cemetery. The interesting thing about this cemetery is that the ch this church was started in 1823 as a mission. In 1865, it is declared a parish, its own parish, and that's when the cemetery begins. I think the first burial was actually recorded in 1866. Um, However, if you walk through that cemetery, you're gonna notice headstones that are dated from the 1700s to like 1831. And the reason for that is the old St. Francis Church or churches, because there have been several along the river. And as we know, the Mississippi River can play havoc when, before we had the levees that we have now in destroying property. And so the original cemetery is probably somewhere in the middle of the Mississippi River. Um, and at one point in 1894, when that last St. Francis Church was being um, inundated, not the present one, mm -hmm. the one before it, was being inundated, there was an appeal to, if you wanted to move your, your family members to this cemetery. Um, some people did. I think the vast majority probably did not um, from what I was reading. So um, those are lost to time. But again, when you visit the cemetery here in the heart of New Roads, you're going to see interments that were people from the old community, the community that lived on the river. And this was made a parish in 1865 um, due to well, the Civil War and the, the, the change that occurred here. But what happened after that was in those 20 or 30 years following the Civil War, there were four major floods along the Mississippi River that they know impacted mm -hmm. the community there. And so people either left or relocated here. And, it, and by, by you know, um, the 1890s, St. Francis has then made a mission of this church um, at that point, and it came under, under your jurisdiction then. One of the things here in New Roads um, that when we were talking on break, that's probably on some of that, the 100 acres that originally belonged to this area or more, is the Catholic Appointee School. It's actually, I think, um, um, Catholic Interparochial um, School of Pointe is the technical name. But this is one of the cases, as we see in rural areas, where we have a school and it's it's pre-K three, yes. so, which is awesome, added that earlier mm -hmm. year, uh, pre-K three through 12th grade. Um, and it, it services really all of Point Capi and even possibly beyond. So it's one of those that it's not just for St. Mary's, right. it's located right here, but it also um, provides schooling for, for all over Point Capi Parish. So they come from Morganza, they come from um, Lakeland and all these gyro, different yes. settlements that are around the river, um, correct? That's right. Um, what is the student body number we're, presently, we're, do you know? I think we're about 730 right now, and we're, we're waiting to see how the numbers are going to shake out for the new school year, but about 730 students. That's awesome. Yes. I know my son-in-law came here, and my nieces and nephews came here, and my daughter, it, it was her adopted school because mm -hmm. all of her friends were here and she ended up, like I said, marrying someone from here. But it's a wonderful little school and the school has a long history here. Um, really it was begun just before this church was, was constructed. Mm -hmm. um, Father LaRoche, I believe, was the pastor at that time. He appealed to the Sisters of St. Joseph, who mm -hmm. had St. Joseph's Academy right. in Baton Rouge to come here and minister and begin a school and then minister to the population here. Um, so they, they came to this area, but thinking back when I was researching this, even before this particular school was here, Poydras Academy, which mm -hmm. is now a museum and art center right up the road, was started for the education of the people in, in Point Capi. And there are so many very wealthy benefactors that lived here uh, that made impacts across the board. And Julian Poydras was one. He was a pillar of the church, never married. He started a trust fund for girls 
uh, a dowry, which is still in existence today for girls in Point Capilla or West Baton Rouge Parish. Mm. And Poydre Street in New Orleans is named after him. He, he gave money to um, orphanages in New Orleans and he established the Poydre's College here. Um, and so for years that um, helped to educate children until the nuns came and started the school here. Um, one of the other ones was St. Augustine is here. It's a non-territorial parish. We'll visit that one in one of our future shows. Uh, it had a school, St. Augustine School, and when desegregation came about, it was merged in the, I believe, in the 60s or 70s with um, Catholic Appoint Capi, and thus, at that point, um, it ceased to exist in that capacity and made it one big interparochial school. So there's a rich history there of education, Catholic education in particular, here in Point Capi. Father Pat, now that you've gotten your feet wet in the parish, because mm -hmm. you've been here such a short time, tell us a little bit about the ministries and what you've observed about um, the community here. It's incredible. Of course, Eucharist is, is our first and primary ministry. Uh, the school is also a, a huge ministry. Uh, but what I found here was a strong core of volunteers who have um, helped this parish thrive in ministry. Everything from Eucharist to the homebound, to the uh, nursing homes, to uh, our, our regular, regular liturgists, to cleaning the church. We actually have people that come into the church and clean this church every week. We have people that clean the office buildings. Um, the, the volunteerism is incredible. And uh, a good strong base, a good strong core, and uh, we've expanded our, our ministries to invite more people in to do things. And I'm not surprised, but the people of this area have responded beautifully and willingly and, and doing a wonderful job. One of the things when I was researching this parish um, that I read, and it, it, I have not said this to you it, when we've been off camera, I read it when you said this, it, it rings true. Uh, repeated pastors have said, if you want something done, ask them, and they will not only do it willingly, but they will do it well. Absolutely. And um, I found that interesting because the last time I saw that quote was like 1981, but obviously this is a trend in this community. But, you know, a small, great rural community, um, and this is their history, this is their church, it's not anything new in this area. Speaking of which, the family names here go mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. 300 years, you know, to the, the original ones that are in that, in that book. Um, the area is isolated in a sense, now we have highways, but for so many years water was it, and then Highway 90, I mean, it, there weren't big roads, river road. Mm -hmm. So this area even has the Creole language still vibrant, and they work at that here. So. The, not just the Catholic history, but their heritage. Mm -hmm. And as a result, speaking of which, um, some of these families were historically very, very wealthy supporters of the church. And you have some priceless um, uh, chalices that were donated to y'all. One from a, um, a duchess, I believe. Um, we've done a show on that, um, that are in your sacristy. And the latest inventory that ended up in archives, y'all had, you know, they found silver crosses and very expensive, very nice pieces that over the years have been donated by family members mm -hmm. from this area. Mm -hmm. um, even I was noticing the plaque out front for the stained glass windows were all donated um, by parishioners here. So, you know, you have a very willing congregation or historically here. Um, before we close though, I have to, um, is there, before I do that, any, anything else in terms of your people or missions or uh, Very charitable, anything? very willing to, to jump in and help wherever they can. Uh, we recently upgraded our uh, communion chalices and uh, families were willing to come forth very quickly and help us with that and they're beautiful. They're, oh, they're beautiful. One thing I almost forgot, tell us a little bit about the Adoration Chapel. Is it a 24 hour It is, one? it is. It's, it's 24 hours um, and it's, it's very well attended. Oh, good. Recently we, we had to adjust some things because uh, some of our doors were not able to come, so we've got other ways of um, reposing the Blessed Sacrament when people can't be here. But yes, we do have a 24 hour. It's not, a, is it attached to this building? It's in a separate building? It's a separate building unto itself. Okay, yes. and they have access 24 hours yes. to be able to come. Yes, we've got two That's methods awesome. of security to get into it, a keypad and a key in a secondary. Very good. Situation. Yes. Um, yes, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the bell that's here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to make sure you were done. I, I kind of abruptly um, jumped back to you, and I'm sorry, but um, 
The one practice that I think the commentator wrote an article about fairly recently was on the a tradition in South Louisiana of blessing bells, having a baptism mm -hmm. of a bell, um, and giving it a godmother and a godfather and in its own <laughs> baptismal name. And um, I that. and again, this parish, both St. Francis when it was the mother church, and again here, the priests are very prolific about writing these events in the in the baptismal book. Um, just like a person, the, the blessing of the bell. Um, this church, when it was initially built, did not have the bell um, in 1865 mm -hmm. the, when, the, when it became a parish. It was later that the bell was acquired. It was actually um, blessed in um, 1876, 78. I'm not, don't quote me on an exact time, but the 1870s um, is when the bell arrived. And the bell here arrived on the famous steamer, the Robert E. Lee. The shipping for it, or the tax to get it here, was one dollar when it came, and it's two pages in the baptismal font, which we'll put up for y'all to see. Of course, it's in French. It was named Marie Seraphine, and the reason for that is the godmother, um, her maiden name was Seraphine Boisdo, B-O-I-S-D-O-R-E. I can't pronounce some of these, these names here, but Boisdor. Um, she was married to Joseph Ritchie, who was a very um, active they were very active in the church here historically. Um, and as a result, uh, all of that is documented for your, for your bell. And it is the bell when they built this church um, in 1907 that was put back up in the tower. Um, the same thing occurred at St. Francis. There are multiple bells, and they all have godparents and, and godfathers. So I, did, I was not aware of this one, I believe, when we wrote the commentator, but i That's the first I, I hear of, of, of baptizing an inanimate object <laughs> other than a human being, but you learn something every day. They do. And it, there was an, <laughs> the commentator did a big study on it. So I did not want to leave without adding to that the fact that, that the bell here is mm -hmm. Marie Seraphine. And um, she came in in 1876-ish or so on the Robert E. Lee, because I found that fascinating. When, mm -hmm. I did not know that about the mm -hmm. history here as many times as I've... I've done um, this region. So, Father, I thank you for being my guest today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Very good. Join us again for another episode of Roots of Faith.